Hello. I'm making a couple of announcements. My name is Kathy. I'm the stage manager here. Um, and every other day of the year, I'm a reference librarian at the library. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the David McCullough Hour. Um, I am so proud uh, that this Library of Congress um, puts on this fabulous festival for you, free, open to the public. What a gift. What a gift. And an even better gift is to have spectacular authors like historian David McCullough sitting on this stage right here with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. He is, I don't have to say this because you said it with your applause, the most celebrated living historian in the United States of America, of the American experience, which is even greater. He's been called the Dean of Americana, and there's a reason why. He has taken us through the Jonestown Flood, the building of the Panama Canal, the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, Harry Truman, John Adams, the Americans in Paris, 
the Wright brothers and sister, um, and this fabulous new book that we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, The Pioneers. So he's won the Pulitzer Prize twice, the National Book Award twice, and he's been given the Presidential Manor, Medal of Honor, or Freedom, excuse me, Freedom, even better than honor. Um, and you've been writing, David, about America. I mean, the, the trajectory has been 150 years since, let's say, the revolution to Charles Lindbergh and beyond. Is there a theme here? Yes, I now see it as I have not. Some things you gain from time going by. I see now that almost, well, all of my books are about Americans who set out to accomplish something worthy that would, they knew would be difficult and was going, going to be more difficult even than they expected, and who did not give up, and who learned from their mistakes, and who eventually ch achieved what their purpose had been in the first place. And always, I, the characters that I've chosen to focus on, always to our benefit. I think that one of the reasons that we ought to read history and know his history is to increase our capacity for, gra for gratitude for those who went before us, of what they did for us, what they achieved for us. And for us to take it for granted is rude in the extreme. And uh, we, I think that two of the qualities that history provides in how we, what we read and what we teach are gratitude and empathy, to put ourselves in the place of those who went before us, what they put up with. In working for the last several years in trying to understand what these pioneers who settled in Ohio had to contend with and what they accomplished against such adversities, I can't help it feel we're a bunch of softies. Um, <laughs> and how much we learn from them and how much we come to know about them that we can't even know in, with people that we are close to in real life. Because for one thing, in real life, you don't get to read other people's diaries and mail. And when you sit down, you have, we're working, say, with the papers of John Adams or Abigail Adams, you really get to know them because they're pouring out all of their innermost ambitions and worries and fears and suffering. That word suffering isn't just that they got hurt or that they worried excessively about their, <coughs> excuse me, the safety of their children. They were suffering. And there's so much that they didn't have that we have now that we take for granted. They had no sedatives, they had no band-aids, they had no chainsaws, they had no, well, a lot. And we should never just say, oh yeah, that's the way it is. Um, we're lucky people. And I've come to feel very strongly we're a good people, we're a good nation. And yes, we make mistakes, and yes, there's evil. And yes, there are people who cheat and lie, and people who uh, have, no, have nothing but selfish ambition. But they are the minority. They are the, extri the exception, not the rule. And it has been that way right along. Well, I don't think there's anybody who has taught us more. Uh, and I mean in a really engaged way. Um, David, you have had a career in which you um, have made history exciting, engaging. You have made it popular. You have brought it to a different level. Um, I know academic historians, I'm thinking of my friend Gordon Wood, who has great admiration for you um, because you have made his subject a subject of great interest. Uh, and in what you just said about the th <coughs> your theme being this tremendous force of history, 
that brought us to where we are, that made us who we are, and um, that the sacrifices and the suffering, as you say, but no one has really engaged a public in the way that you have. And uh, here is a person who has been, in the last 50 years of book writing, not one book, these are books that have sold millions and been translated into many languages, not one book has gone out of print in the course of 50 years. That's pretty amazing. So my, my I'd, li I'd like to make another point, and this is all somewhat confessional at the stage in life I've reached. But I've never undertaken a subject that I knew anything much about, honestly. And if I knew all about it, I wouldn't want to write the book. To me, the book, <laughs> the writing of the book is an adventure. And often an adventure with, ex with consequences that I never expected. And I've got, it's as if I'm going to, uh, to a continent that I've never set foot on. When I started off to write the Brooklyn Bridge, well, let me just say what, how, how that happened. Um, and by the way, let me say, first of all, my ambition to write began in the Library of Congress. I was up there. I, I had quit my job in New York, where I worked at Time and Life, because President Kennedy called on us, I was still in my 20s, to do something for our country. And I came down to Washington. I knew nobody in the Kennedy crowd. I knew nobody uh, in the government. But I thought somewhere there's some organization that could use what I've had in my education and my working experience. And I wound up being the editor of a magazine published by the US Information Agency. And it was a picture magazine, very much like the old Life magazine. And I had to spend a lot of time doing picture research at the Library of Congress. And one day I was, went in the prints and photographs section, and there spread out on a big table were photographs taken by a photographer who had somehow managed to get himself over the mountains and down into Johnstown right after the catastrophic Johnstown flood. And I looked at those pictures, I have my God, what happened, the destruction, the utter the terrible destruction. Now, I grew up in Pittsburgh, where, which isn't very far from Johnstown. And as boys, my brothers and I used to make a lake of gravy and a lake of gravy in the mashed potatoes. And then we'd take our forks and break the, through the potatoes and the, as the gravy flowed down among the peas, we'd, we'd say the Johnstown flood, <laughs> having no idea whatsoever what that was. So I saw those photographs and I thought, I've, I've got to read more about what the hell happened. I just got curiosity. That's the great thing to stimulate in learning and teaching. But in any event, I worked for three years, book was published, and right away, two other publishers from my own publisher came to me and one wanted me to do the Chicago fire and the other wanted me to do the San Francisco earthquake. So I was still in my 30s and I was being typecast as Bad News McCullough. <laughs> and I didn't like that. And um, I determined I'm gonna do something where we did, where human beings did something right, something noble, something admirable, something we are still quite aware of. And one day I was having lunch with some friends down the Lower East Side of New York one was a science writer, the other was a, a, uh, an engineer, had been professor of engineering. And they got going about all that the people who built the Brooklyn Bridge didn't know that they were in for when they started on the project. And my wife, Rosalie, and I had lived in Brooklyn when we were first married. Uh, the, the Roblings who were involved with it 
got their start in my hometown of Pittsburgh, I felt connected. And I also thought there is a hugely admirable com com composition, accomplishment that we Americans all know and will always know it's emblematic of what we stand for in so many ways. And I went out of that lunch knowing that's my next subject. I knew nothing about physics. I was terrible at physics in school. I wasn't a very good mathematician, but I thought if I can find somebody who can explain this to me in the English language, we'll be fine. And then we heard that there was a wonderful collection of letters and diaries and all the rest of the Roebling family up at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic in Troy, New York. So one cool, beautiful fall day, Rosalie and I drove up to Troy to go see this collection. And the library then was in an old church building, a sort of a grim uh, old Gothic church, and not a very good building for a library. And because there was an away football game by the Troy team, uh, the, the, the MI Polytech team, uh, the place, the campus was empty. So we went in, there was one woman behind the desk, and she said, yes, the Roebling collection is upstairs on the th fourth floor. I can't take you up there because I'm the only one on duty. Here's the key. And, and we climbed the stairs, and they were creaky stairs, and the light bulbs got dimmer as we got higher. I think they're probably 40 watts at most by the time we got to the top floor. And she said, it's the first door on the left. And I expected some room, a library room was a table and maybe a work table and chairs. And we opened the door and it was nothing but a closet and with shelves on three sides from floor to ceiling, big closet, packed with papers, diaries, tied up with old shoestrings that clearly had not been untied in 50 years or more, and statues and and I looked at it and I said, oh my God. And Rosalie was behind me said, oh my God. <laughs> no, there goes three more years. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, what an adventure, what a, what a story. Yeah. I'd like to point something out about that. that it, it, it was 150 years ago this year that work began on building the Brooklyn Bridge. That accomplishment would not have happened if it hadn't been for immigrants. The immigrants... <laughs> including, including the genius who designed it. John A. Roebling was an immigrant from Germany. And the men that went down into the caissons, the worst imaginable work imaginable. Uh, all, all immigrants. And so were the people who built the Transcontinental Railroad 150 years ago this year. 20,000 Chinese worked to make that successful. And they did the toughest part of the whole job, which was out west. Kennedy said, we will go to the moon. And we did 50 years ago. And let us not forget that if it weren't for Werner von Braun and about seven other highly skilled, brilliant technicians who also were immigrants, it wouldn't have happened. We are all in need of immigrants. And we are immigrants, most all of us. We are immigrants. Wow. Well, well, well. I was, David, thank you for that. I was going to ask you, my next question was, what is your secret sauce? But I think you just gave it away. I'd like to add one more quick story. <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote my first book, The John Sound Flood, my editor was a wonderful guy named Peter Schwade. And he was famous for titles. He, he did The Longest Day for the book about the invasion of the D-Day. Uh, Blackboard Jungle, uh, he, he, and he was very proud of it, rightly so. So when I finished the book, I hadn't talked to him since we agreed the, the contract. 
And I couldn't come up with a title for the Johnstown Flood. I, sh I searched through the Bible. I searched through Shakespeare. Couldn't find a thing, but I, saw, I can't delay this any longer. So I called him up and said, Mr. Schwade, wondering if he remembered who I was. I, I said, this is David McCullough. He said, oh yeah, how are you? He had a, sort of a Damon Runyon way of talking. I said, I'm fine, and I finished my book, but I know how, how brilliant you are at titles and how important titles are to you, but I can't come up with a title for this book. He said, no, no secret to a title for that book. Call it the Johnstown Flood. <laughs> he said, what were you thinking of calling it? One wet Wednesday? <laughs> Well, so then I finally finished the, <laughs> finished the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge book, and I called him up and said, Mr. Schwade, I'm finished. The Brooklyn Bridge book is done, and I'm very happy about it, and I've sent it on to you. Hey, did you receive it? And he said, yes. And then he said, how do you spell Niagara? I said, N-I-R-G-A. <laughs> Wrong! It's N-I-A-G-A-R-A, and now I've got to have Alice go all the way through the manuscript with her whiteouts and change all that. <laughs> I said, well, what did you think of the book? He said, oh, it's terrific. <laughs> 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 but we can never underestimate, and I really want to make this point, the, the importance of so many people who make a book possible, and particularly the kinds of books that I write and others. Editors particularly, of course, but, uh, but librarians and archivists. And I, I just thank goodness for the m wonderful people that I've had the good fortune to work with at the Library of Congress and at innumerable other libraries, both here and in Europe, and the wonderful editors I've had who, it's a joint effort, and almost nothing is ever accomplished alone. There's no, th there's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. That's nonsense. We're all the result of so many people who've helped and taught us and, and sometimes been rivals. And um, thank goodness for it. I think one of the most important lessons of history is learn from your mistakes. Don't be the kind of person that when you're knocked down, don't lie there and whimper and moan and, moan and feel sorry for yourself. Get up. Figure out what, what you did wrong, why it didn't work, and get back to work. Is that the American character? I think so. And, well, I, and I think it needs to be cultivated and encouraged in our young people. Well, you have a passion for the American character, and you have a passion for, and I've heard you say this because we've been friends for a while, long while, and I've heard you so excited about um, seeing material that you haven't seen before and saying, oh my God, this is extraordinary. And, and, and the process of getting the details and all of that is a very passionate process for you. But also, you've written a lot about people who have been written about a lot, like John Adams and Truman, and, but you do it a different way. What is that different way, do you think? Well, Truman and Adams have in common that they were both upstaged by the president who preceded them and the president who followed them. Men who were taller, better looking, more famous, so forth. Um, and I felt in both cases, both Adams and Truman deserve far more attention than they've been given. I remember the night of the 48 election, I was in high school and <clears throat> my father, we very Republican family, and my father was listening all night to see who won. I tried to stay awake. I couldn't. I went to bed. And the next morning, Dad was in shaving. And I went in and said, Dad, Dad, who won? He said, Truman, like it was the end of the world. And um, I don't know, 30 years later, I was back home. We sat down to have a chat after dinner. And he started telling me about how the world was going to hell and the country was going to hell. And then he paused and he said, too bad old Harry isn't still in the White House. <laughs> and that's what happens. The dust settles and you see them differently. You judge them differently. And he himself said that, you have to wait 50 years. And, uh, but with this book, I was writing about people you never heard of and nobody's ever heard of, including historians. 
And I had dreamed of doing that someday. Uh, I did, why do I need to have a, 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 hit, a celebrity from the past to help me get everybody into the tent? Let's do it just on the story that's there to be told. I was hugely influenced by Thornton Wilder when I was in college, and I loved our town. This was at Yale. At Yale, and our town is a classic American masterpiece. Could I ever find a situation, a story, where there was sufficient material to tell the story in their language, from their point of view, of a group of people you've never heard of? Well, it was one of the most thrilling strokes of luck in my working writing life that I found this incredible collection in, of all places, a small college library in Ohio, Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio. And it was all the papers, all the letters and diaries of these first pioneers, numbering in the thousands, the letters and diaries, and the, the, done primarily by five different characters. And they pour out what they're worried about, what they're, what they're striving to achieve, what they stand for, as do, as do their wives and some of their children. Um, and there it was, and it wasn't in somebody's attic or some grim place. It was all superbly collected and a marvelous librarian, one of the best people I've ever worked with, uh, Linda Showalter, who knows the collection up and down and, realized, and realizes how vastly important it is. These people who went out to Ohio in the last part of the 18th century had passed what was known as the Northwest Ordinance, meaning north and west of the Ohio River. You say that it's as important as the Declaration of Independence? It was, or the Magna because they, they said in this, one of the most important bills ever passed by Congress, they said it's not enough to say all men are created equal and then have all your slaves out in the lawn fixing up how everything looked. They said if all men are created, we, we will not have slavery. So they said there will be no slavery in this territory which was to make up five new states, which in area, ge geographic area, was as large as all the original 13 colonies. So they in double the size of the country and said in this half of the country, there'll be no slavery. And that was, that was the work of principally one man who had never lobbied a, a legislature in his life. He didn't have the word lobbied yet. He was a classic 18th century polymath. He was, a, he was a lawyer and a doctor and a divinity, doctor of divinity, all in one person. He was also the leading naturalist uh, botanist of his time, an American botanist. He was, he was interested in everything. And he said, we will treat the Native Americans with respect and fairness, and he said, will be complete freedom of religion, and there will be public education, education for everybody. And there was no public education in Massachusetts or Connecticut or anywhere at that point. So those three hugely important advances were promoted and got passed by Congress by one man. And we don't even know him, or we didn't until we'd started to write about it. Then when, after Jefferson was elected and the, Jefferson, the political party with Jefferson decided they were gonna, in, let the, master, in the, the Ohio legislature, they were gonna change the rule on slavery and admit slaves. This was in 1804. Meantime, Manessa Cutler's son, Ephraim Cutler, had gone out as one of the pioneers. And he was still a young man, and he was elected to the legislature. And he was working with a, one of Washington's generals, who was one of the original pioneers to go out, named Rufus Putnam. And they were battling to stop this move to disband the rule and allow slavery. And the day of the vote, Ephraim Cutler 
was deathly ill in bed in a boarding house near the legislature building. And Putnam came to him, who, Putnam was old enough to have been his father, came up to his room and said, you've got to get up out of bed because we're going to cast the boat today. And he said, I can't. He said, you've got to. So he did. Some people say he was carried in on a stretcher. I found no proof of that. In any event, he got to the legislature. He gave a powerful speech and he voted. And the measure to introduce slavery into Ohio and thus to the whole Northwest Territory was defeated by one vote. <laughs> and yet nobody has ever heard of his name. And people, people have said to me, if you'd put this in a novel, your editor would say, no, but this would never happen in real life. It did happen in real life. And we should know about that and know about him. And he's the one who did more than anybody else to get education passed by the legislature later on, providing school, public schooling, public learning, all the way through the University of Ohio. And he was doing it as was Ruth Lewis Putnam because neither of them had had a proper education. They knew what it was to not be educated. Last night we heard it's a report that today 30% of our population is illiterate. We've still got a long, long way to go and we've got to get busy and fix that. Absolutely. And you're doing a good piece of it. You have always been, I, you know, you are in many ways the great uh, American teacher of history. Um, and you have brought history to, to, to the masses. I want to know, what is the state of history in schoolrooms today? Do you have an idea? It's not good at all. And I think it's largely because of, and I'm not trying to be unfair, about with to do with the teachers and the required courses that it's the system. Teachers should not be allowed to ma major in education. They should major in a subject. The, the American teacher who reached more children than anybody who ever lived is Mr. Rogers. He was taught by a woman who taught at the University of Pittsburgh named Margaret McFarland. And her great admonition to teachers is show them what you love and they will love it too. Now you can't love something you don't know any more than you can love someone you don't know. So if you graduate with a degree in education and you don't know anything about English or history particularly or math or what, and you're assigned to teach that course, you're not going to be a very good teacher. So. And I would also bring back required courses. 80% of our colleges now today will no longer require take, take, taking any history in the four years of college. That's wrong. I think it's also important that students get to understand fairly early in life that some things in life are required. <laughs> I, um, I'd like very much to read you a couple of things, if I may. Please do, please do. This is an account by the granddaughter of one of my five characters, remembering how life was growing up in the family. And um, particularly her, her grandmother. Barker, the Barker children were raised as one daughter, Catherine would remember, quote, to be useful to be pleasant with your playmates, respectful to superiors, just to all, <coughs> excuse me, black or white, good to the poor, not showing pride or selfishness, but kindness and goodwill, and to see to it that we look to our own more than to the faults of others. And she said there was a, expression that her mother most frequently repeated. Count the day lost at which the setting sun sees at its close no worthy action done. These people, imagine this, believed in telling the truth. 
They did not believe in lying or cheating or being unkind to people because they had some peculiarity, who believed strongly that all men should be not only created equal, but treated equally, <laughs> and who worked hard to be useful all their lives. And many of us in this room, I know, were brought up that way. What'd you do today to make things a little better for somebody? Now, I'd also like to read to you one of the a passage from one of the letters that Ephraim Cutler wrote to his wife, Sally. Their correspondence is marvelous, touching in the extreme. He's up at um, the legislature in Massachusetts. It's late December. Christmas is about to happen. He wants to be home. And uh, he's still just trying to get this legislation through about education. And he wrote to her, Sally, a long letter over the, quote, thick-headed mortals and knaves of politics. <laughs> I've just returned from attending a meeting of our committee, and all is hushed in slumber in the adjoining rooms, the boarding house. The difficulty in making thick-headed mortals understand plain questions is sometimes vexing. But this evening, our committee has had to contend with, with art and avarice combined. There is nowhere to be found knaves more designing than at a legislature, where designing scoundrels lurk, and with spe specious words and demure looks, they calculate to entrap the unwary and, like bloodsuckers, leech and suck the public. You see how things have changed? <laughs> he was fed up, truly tired of it, he wrote. My head, hands, and even heart are engaged in the labors before me. But by no means did he consider giving up. With his New England background and his devotion to the cause of learning was no less than ever, and he succeeded. Pretty great. It is, thank you. Now, this, this particular story, which is an extraordinary story, and we don't know it, and we don't know it well enough, um, there are several questions that I want to ask you about it. But first of all, the, the, the mix of people who were in this um, rush west were, I mean, you have Yale, young Yale graduates, young Harvard graduates. You have also the, the warriors who have just finished the Revolutionary War yeah. and who are being paid in whiskey, right. you, have, um, you have a kind of rough and tumble, and you have these ideals at the same time, which seems to me a kind of uh, representation of American, sort of the way we do things. It's a, you know, it's a frontier. There are those who have come from the battlefield and will, will be useful to you. There are those who come from the halls of, of uh, uh, education will be useful to you. I think one thing that we have to remember, and this is a serious reality that we ought to understand, is how hard people had to work then. It wasn't just that they believed in work as part of the way of the, uh, a, a, a contributing life, but work for survival. And um, children worked, women worked. Women, in many ways, worked harder even than men, not from dawn to dusk and more. Um, and this particular group, and this is very, very important, were fundamentally <coughs> descendants from the Puritans. Now, Every time I undertake a book, because I didn't know anything about it when I began, I learn an immense amount. And one of the things that I've come to understand, as I never did before, as well as I should have, is about the Puritans. My impression was they all wore black, and no, they wanted nobody to ever have any fun. Um, they didn't wear black. Their ministers did, but they didn't. They wore colorful clothes. And they liked to sing and liked to dance. They liked to have a little wine. Uh, they were human beings. What they did believe in was education, learning. 
because it was their conviction that in order to understand the, the realm of God, religion, the better life, the better understanding, the better humanity, you had to be able to read. And particularly, you had to be able to read the Bible. <laughs> Excuse me. So there, there was no question about the, the necessity of education. Hence, all those great early schools and colleges like Harvard, Yale, others, were all started because they believed in education. And that, thank goodness, became a part of the creed of our country in large part because of this success in the new realm called the Northwest Territory. Imagine if slavery had been introduced into Ohio and Illinois. The difference in our history, the history turned on that one thing. Imagine there'd been no Abraham Lincoln or Ulysses S. Grant. And think what has come out of Ohio. Now, to what degree we can attribute this, it may be something in the water, I don't know, but <laughs> the man who first circled the earth and the man who first put his feet on the moon not only came from the same place, the same state, Ohio, it came from the same part of Ohio. Now, is that coincidental? I'm not sure. Um, Edison, uh, we can go on and on, all came out of this place where they first introduced public education. I love, and of course, the Wright brothers, I loved it when Wilbur Wright was asked, what's the secret of, you, what's, what's the secret of success as you understand it? He said, pick out a good mother and father and grow up in Ohio. <laughs> but I, I, um, I hope this doesn't sound pretentious, but I've never said it in front of an audience before. But I, I feel with every project I undertake, I'm do, trying to do something for my country. Indeed, you have. Indeed, yeah. you have. I think you have. <laughs> you have. You've taught us about, you've taught us about American ingenuity. You've taught us perhaps that even though the world was smaller back then and much more controllable, and in a sense you see, I mean you see Ohio, in this, in this book, you see Ohio grow from Cutler who, who comes in the first, you know, mm -hmm. people to actually uh, go west and establish Marietta, Ohio. By the end of the story, by his death, there are millions of people in Ohio. And that, that uh, enormous energy of, of building. I he think got off on the right foot. He did get off but on the, the right side, foot. The state did, as did the whole territory. Yes. Now, I don't know how far many more minutes we have, but I just want to tell this audience something. Please. I've just, I'm reading a book that's phenomenal. It's called Silver, the, Silver, oh, the Sword, oh, stop. and Stone. And it's by somebody named Marie Arana. And He's also a very generous man. No, and honestly, I thought I knew a lot about history. <laughs> I know nothing about history compared to what's in that book, this whole history of Latin America, and all that went long before any of the colonial people showed up or even Columbus showed up. It, this brilliant American is an immigrant, and this brilliant American has done a hell of a lot in her short time that does, deserves more attention and praise and gratitude than you, you'll ever get. David, thank I'm, you. Oh my goodness. Oh. I think I can just die and go to heaven. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Well, um, David, let's talk about the way that the world was so much smaller then, because I want to ask you, um, how can we get back to that sort of ingenuity, hard work, um, respect for freedom of religion, which sometimes in some places we seem to have lost, uh, how we get back to the, um, the, the value the, of, of education so that when people leave, as we heard yesterday uh, 
from David Rubenstein, when people leave college, there are some people who graduate from college and never read, never a book read again, another book. Never read another book. Um, how can we get back to some of those values, or do you think that's gone? With well, I, I truly believe that the people who are doing the most important work in our country, clearly the most important work, are our teachers. They are, they, are shape, they are shaping our future. They are the ones that mold all of us. And I doubt that there's anybody here today who can't right away remember Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so who changed your life because of the way they taught some subject or something that they once said to you that you've never forgotten. I've had teachers all the way through grade school high school and college that I know changed my life because of one thing, their attitude, their enthusiasm for their subject, their understanding that you have to work to achieve learning and that information isn't learning. Information isn't learning. If information were learning, if you memorize the World Almanac, you'd be educated. If you memorize the World Almanac, you wouldn't be educated, you'd be weird. <laughs> and the difference between a s information or facts and a story. E.M. Forrester, the great English novelist, said, if I tell you the king died and then the queen died, that's a sequence of events. If I tell you the king died and the queen died of grief, that's a story. It's that difference of the story. And one of the writers who influenced me enormously was Barbara Tuckman. And she said, there's no trick to teaching history or writing history, tell stories. That's what we all are. Each of us is a story. Each city, each town, each road that we, we, goes west or south or north is a story. Every river is a story. Mark Twain understood that right away. River towns are story towns, because there's always something passing through, always something new. And we always want to know, how's it come out? What's it come out to? I think, too, if we can encourage our children to get up off out of the chair and do something besides watch television, if we can get people working on good projects. Uh, it could be building model airplanes, if you want, or it could be working with the Library of Congress. And we can do that. And we can encourage them to do that. When I got my first library card, that for me was ex exciting was when I got my first driver's license. Mm -hmm. um, it changes your life. I grew up in Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh, the, the, the library and the Carnegie Museum and the Carnegie Concert Hall are all under the same roof. And I think that had a big influence on me and all the others growing up there, because we never thought of them as separate. The books, the music, the art, the science, the dinosaurs, the paintings, all part of a rainy day Saturday, and uh, a terrific part, and part of education, part of the, of the story. Um, I was just recalling this morning with a friend I went with a, 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 school, a high school classmate with his mother and father on a history tour at spring vacation. And we drove from Pittsburgh down to Charlottesville and went to Monticello, saw the old campus of University of Virginia, then went on to Washington, then came back and stopped at, at to Gettysburg. And it just opened my eyes in a way to American history as nothing ever had. I was just. I was dizzy. And I also thought that the University of Virginia looked very appealing, very attractive. And I was, my older brothers had gone to Yale and I was sort of thinking I would go to Yale. And my English teacher had gone to Yale and he was a wonderful character from Maine named Lowell Innes. And I went in to see him after I got back from the trip and I said, Mr. Innes, I've just had a wonderful trip with Steve and his mother and father, and, and uh, went, we went to the University of Virginia and saw the beautiful campus there. 
and I was thinking maybe I might apply at the University of Virginia. And he was standing right close to me, and he was sh considerably shorter than I, and he jammed his finger into my chest, and he said, you're going to Yale, McCullough, and I don't want to hear any more about it. <laughs> you know, he didn't say, well, let's sit down and talk about your innermost feelings. And <laughs> it, was, it was a different approach. And I never thought about going to the University of Virginia again. <laughs> Great teachers change the world. I've been doing a collection of prominent people who figured in our story in all fields, music, art, literature, politics, all of it. And who was the teacher that they gave credit for being what they were? And every single one of them had such a teacher. And one of the most lovely of all is Willa Cather, what she had to say about her teachers. And then, of course, she wound up being a teacher for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So if, I don't know how many are teachers here, but you're doing what needs to be done. Here's to you. <clears throat> Uh, speaking of teachers, um, I want to know what you think about, I mean, you're a person who has really two ways of communicating. You're hearing one way of communicating. He's an astonishingly powerful voice as a narrator. We have heard his voice on uh, the John Adams series and on the uh, Ken Burns and whatnot. We have, we have heard David's voice telling these stories, but telling the story on a page requires a certain mastery of language, a certain sensitivity, sensibility toward the rhythm of a sentence. Um, tell us about your approach to language itself. Well, I've always felt that to be a writer, you have to be a rewriter. So I write everything I write many times over. I also believe in writing for the ear as well as the eye. Because if somebody reads it back to you, or even in some cases, you read it yourself, you hear when you're repeating some word too often, or when your sentence structure is repetitive, or when you're boring. Um, and Rosalie, my wife Rosalie, reads everything that I write aloud to me. And um, we were working on the last chapters of my book about Theodore Roosevelt. This I will never forget. And she, she came to a sentence and she read it and she said, there's something wrong with that sentence. And I said, well, read it again. So she read it again and I said, no, there's nothing wrong with that sentence. She said, oh, yes, there is. I said, give it to me. <laughs> it was not me at my best. And I, I read it to her. I said, see, nothing wrong with it. She said, oh, yes, there is. I said, well, let's just go on. So we went on, and the book eventually went on to the publisher, and it was published, and it got wonderful reviews, except in the New York Review of Books, in a review by Gore Vidal, he stopped at one point and said, sometimes, however, Mr. McCullough doesn't write very well. <laughs> Consider this sentence. <laughs> I have to tell you something else about, about, about the voice. There was a big snowstorm in Boston when we were living there, and everything stopped, and you couldn't get food. You, so I went over to the Star Market in Back Bay to load up on provisions. And um, I had, we worked out a list and I went. And that guy had found everything we wanted except cashews. And as you all know, you can't survive without cashews. <laughs> so there was this fellow walking by with a Star Market label on his shirt. And I said, excuse me, sir, but can you tell me where I'd find the cashews? He said, yes, I'll show you, follow me. So we followed him and he pointed it out. I thanked him very much. He went on his way. Well, 10 minutes later or so, I was checking out the cash register and he came up to me and he said, excuse me, were you the narrator of the Ken Burns series, The Civil War? 
I said, yes, I was. He said, I have to thank you from the bottom of my heart, because when that series first came on the air, I was suffering terribly from insomnia. <laughs> He said, I'd hear that voice and go right out. <laughs> I don't believe that. But That's anyway. absolutely true. <laughs> no, so, I think that writing is, um, is all important. I think the first page of a book is crucial, critical. I think that how a book ends is critical. One of my favorite endings of one of my books is when the Wright brothers put on their first exhibit of what they could do at home out at the cow pasture where they had been experimenting all those years. And Orville wanted to take his father up, and his father was in his 80s. And up they went, old Bishop Wright, wonderful man. And all the time they were up there, Bishop Wright kept saying, higher, Orville, higher. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. Also, the, the, the quote that we, I began that book with, Wilbur said, no bird ever soared in a calm. You've got to have adversity. You've got to have the wind against you in order to lift off. And that's so true, so very true. If everything were easy and we did nothing but sit around, we would not only not accomplish much of anything, I don't think we'd be very happy. And uh, there's always something that needs fixed, always people who need help, always advances that are exciting. What's happening in medicine right now under our very noses is gonna be written about for years and years as maybe the most important events of our time. It's exciting and it's all human ingenuity, human pers perseverance and admirable use of the mind in working together, all of it. I wish I could live another 80 years. It's, uh, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> we do too. We do too. Now, I, I also must insist on revealing the secret of my whole career, success, accomplishments, everything. Her name is Rosalie Barnes McCullough. And Rosalie, Rosalie is a the, our Secretary of the Treasury. She's Chair of the Ethics Committee. <laughs> and she's the most wonderful editor, partner in this work that one could imagine. Sweetheart, would you please stand up? That is a great, great segue into, thank you for that, because that was going to be my next question. Um, and thinking of Rosalie, how, how helpful she's been, especially um, trying to save you from that sentence, whatever it was. But um, as a member of my gender, you, I want to say, because in, in, when you treat John Adams, Abigail is there. When you treat the Wright brothers, the sister, the sister is, there. is there. When I treat Washington Roebling, Emily Roebling takes over. Takes in, in over. The last stages. Absolutely. Yep. And in this book, <laughs> yep. my goodness, the women are at it, building, Indi building indispensable. this country. Yeah. So they've never been given sufficient credit, but that is changing. Thank goodness. <laughs> years ago, years ago, I read a marvelous book. I've never forgotten it, and I'd still tell people about it, by a man with a distinguished name, Ashley Montague. It was called The Natural Superiority of Women. And he had studied this seriously as an anthropologist and scholar. Women live longer. Women are less susceptible to disease. Women mature in their minds, their bodies, faster than men. Uh, they they are stronger on a per, per weight basis. Um, and it, it's very easy to understand why, because women are, necess are necessities 
in order for the race to survive. Men are no good except, remember, 90% of our time has been lived as cavemen. They're prehistoric people. All the men had to be able to do was plant the seed and go out and face the saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> but women had to raise these young minds, these brains, because we're the only animal that isn't born ready to go. And therefore, they have to be around, the mothers, the women, for at least eight to 15 years. Now they know it's probably about 25 years. <laughs> no, truly. The mind doesn't fully develop until about 22 or 23 years old. But, um, but isn't it wonderful? That's progress. Wonderful. That's real progress. David, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of everybody's heart here. And I want to read what the Presidential Medal from Freedom citation, uh, which I think encapsulates the, the great gifts that you've given this nation, that you've given us in making all of that history come, al come alive. One of our nation's most distinguished and honored historians, David McCullough, has taken his own place in American history. The United States honors David McCullough for his lifelong efforts to document the people, places, and events that have shaped America. And so we honor you, David Thank McCullough. Thank you, dear. <laughs> Give me a minute. How are you, sweetheart? <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. A great job. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Can I say one more thing? You can say one more thing. One more thing, one more thing. Maybe we're not on mic. Keep up the good work. Okay, there you go.